You're watching a live episode of Making Tracks. I'm your co-host, Mark Newbold, and joining me this afternoon, because here in the UK it's this afternoon, not in the future quite yet, is my co-host, Mark Mulcaster. But Mark, I want you, I always usually let you introduce yourself, but I want you to give yourself a bit of a bit of pepper and a bit of flavour oh, before we dive into talking about the Empire Strikes Back. What's the most interesting thing about you, Mark? Uh, the most interesting thing of them is that I am the only Mark Mulcaster on Facebook. Wow. Which I think, I think that's quite impressive, I think, anyway. Yeah. Consider the amount of people who are on Facebook. So that's either true. that means the other Mark Mulcasters haven't been bothered to join and they're all on Instagram. But, yeah, every time I look anyway, it's only me. So okay. um, welcome, everybody. Hope you're well and uh, dandy and everybody is keeping, um, keeping safe. Don't forget, if you're in the room, you're welcome to drop us a message, ask us questions. It can be about anything. Um, mainly today we're talking about Empire Strikes Back and some of the comics and stuff around that. So if it's that, that's fine. If it's about anything else, um, be great. You know, those who were here early saw some of our collections and music bits and bobs. So <laughs> if, if we run out of things to talk about, we'll just turn this into a show and tell. So... We'll never run out of things to talk about. No. I don't think we've ever talk, run out of things. It's Star Wars. How can we run out of things to talk about? I know, Forget, right? Yes, yeah. we'll talk about the holiday special. We'll be fine. Yeah, um, we'll like to talk about. Of course. But we will start talking about The Empire Strikes Back. So we'll, we will kick off with a very obvious and uh, often asked question. And I'm going to ask you, Mark, because there's kind of a reason for asking it compared to me. Uh, where and when did you first see Empire? Where... Um, I first saw The Empire Strikes Back on one of those. Ah, nice. Yeah, and in fact, this copy. So Empire Strikes yeah. Back. And look, everybody, I've rewound it as well. I, <laughs> I actually probably rewound it. So I don't get any fees from Blockbuster. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I missed it when it first came out in the cinema because I was born in 81. Um, and I think the first time I at least properly saw it, was like I said about ninety two, um, when I borrowed it off my mate on VHS. Um, I remember the first time I saw it in the cinema was a special edition. So that was I think it was May for us, May nineteen ninety seven, yeah. and it came out just two weeks before Return of the Jedi. So you had Empire Strikes Back, and then two weeks gap, and then Return of the Jedi, which was actually quite awesome and probably more how um, George wanted it to be, I guess. Really, yeah. if you could have, yeah. Yeah. How about you then, Mr. Newbold? For me, I just managed to grab that because it just looks cool. Uh, yeah. I didn't see it for the first time on that. Uh, the first time I saw it was a double bill. If anyone listens to Making Tracks, hope you do. We have talked about this briefly. Uh, the first time I saw it was a double bill with Herbie Goes Bananas. And my instant reaction when I left the cinema as a nine-year-old kid was, wasn't Herbie, knows, Herbie Goes Bananas great? Um, <laughs> so it was definitely a grower. There's a lot of Star Wars films kind of are growers, and I think Empire's in a weird way, is the one that we look back and think when you're kids, when you're like seven or eight and you're scrapping around the playground and you want to be Luca, you want to be Han or you want to be Leia or whoever. If you're tall like me, you ended up being Chewy. Um, you know, you just, you know, you, you, it, Star Wars was more of an action adventure kid, kids film, if that makes sense. Whereas Empire was that bit darker and that bit deeper and more to chew on and more to think on. So I think Empire matured with us. You know, we sort of grew with Empire and grew into Empire. And I think Empire made more sense once Jedi came out. So, yeah, it, it was a different sort of beast, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah no, I think you're right. Um, it's it's one of those things you end up with, uh, like, you, you have a battle off at the start. So you have a big, basically, almost a big kind of like, you know, money shot yeah. kind of climax battle right at the start. And then it's where do you go from there? Um, and where they went was basically they spent a lot of time developing the characters and yeah. the, the relationships between the characters, which they um, didn't really get a chance to do with for New Hope because it was just all kind of like gun and run and just kind of like get through the story, get through the beats. So, um, yeah, you know, um, I was a bit like you. I mean, I liked Empire, but that that middle kind of section with, with Yoda was great. But if I was going to have a nap, when I was watching Empire when I was like 12 or 13, if I was going to drift off, it was probably going to be through some of that. I've got a feeling I yeah. even fast forwarded it for a couple of times just to get to the best in stuff. So it's funny, like you say, I think Empire grows. The more you knew from Jedi, it sort of filled in a lot of stuff. 
and then you realise that Empire really was the cornerstone. Yeah, of, uh, certainly the original trilogy, but weirdly, as it's gone on, all of it in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I reckon so. I mean, it's. I, I think it's really hard to judge a trilogy, and um, I had to say this a lot a few years ago to a number of my friends. Like, it's, you can't judge a trilogy based on the first two films. You've got to wait for all three to come out. And I even think that's the same with the original trilogy. You know, it's like you said, it, once you get to Return of the Jedi and everything resolves and everything kind of slots in, it all kind of feels a lot better. You kind of like understand where things are going and you understand why you kind of need to have that lower, slower yeah. kind of pace in the middle section. Um, yeah. It's kind of like it's... I mean, I think Gandalf said it best. It's like the deep inhale before the plunge. And so it kind of was really, you know, you kind of, the, the, the plunge of going into it's like a darker area of, um, of a storytelling and then the resolution at the end. So, yeah. We spoke about this on the show recently. It's a weird thing with Star Wars. And I think the format, latest episode, we talked about it a lot, that the format of yeah. Star Wars is probably about to change, you know, television and, and seasons and then Obi-Wan being a limited series and Kathleen Kennedy saying maybe... Uh, trilogies aren't the way we're always going to go maybe trilogies will work for certain stories but it might not always work for star wars going forward it's yeah change it up a bit which i don't <laughs> think is an unhealthy thing I and mean, there's a good good uh good way to look at it but in terms of let's say classic star wars the nine the the, the skywalker saga do you think it's always important to have the middle one be the empire one you know the dark one the one where all the big reveals are the twists so you've got the resolution in the third one or do you think you could change it up um, well, I mean, I suppose you could, but it's, it seems to be the classic kind of storytelling. I mean, you, even if you step away from Star Wars or, you know, a lot of the trilogies, you look at like Back to the Future, that, that, that second part had like an amazing kind of like cliffhanger at the end, you know, and it, I mean, you know, they, they teed it right up for number three. It's kind of like, you know, you can't go anywhere else, but where they, where they go. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I suppose you probably, you know, in some respects, you can't. I think you need, you know, in some respects, I think it's good and healthy to to give something unresolved. So, A, it brings some of the audience back, which obviously is great for the box office, but it gives people a chance to, you know, discuss it and speculate and, you know, kind of like come up with their own ideas, which, yeah. as we know, can sometimes be a little bit dangerous. But um, it's, I think, you know, I think from the, the way the story is kind of structured, it kind of, it has that kind of feel. And even if it's, even if you step in and you look at each of the films, each films have kind of got that kind of cliffhanger middle kind of section where like, you're not sure what's going to happen. There's always res you know, conflict and resolution in any kind of narrative kind of structure, really. So, um, but yes, I think it's, it's un unfortunate that now any uh, subsequent, trilogy that we've had everybody always refers to like oh the middle one's going to be the dark one it's going to be the empire one and everybody expects yeah. that so um you know sometimes that middle chapter needs to be a little bit um you know go a different direction i think just to kind of like you know challenge the expectations of the audience i'm trying to kind of like sidestep talking about the last jedi <laughs> no it's fine it's fine i mean it's it's a weird one in that Last Jedi in the sequel trilogy is definitely the Dark Empire style one with big reveals. Yeah. You know, Attack of the Clones, though, feels like the, the, the odd one out because Revenge of the Sith had to end dark, didn't it? Yeah, exactly. Sith, Sith was the Empire level dark film in that trilogy. So yeah. it doesn't always follow, does it? No, but then I suppose if you say Sith has got the resolution of like the story, if the story was basically about the fall of the Republic and the, the, the descent into darkness by Anakin Skywalker, then obviously yeah. that's the resolution is that although the actual overall kind of story is not resolved because it goes on to four, five and six, the, yeah. um, you know, in, in some respects, part of the cliffhanger of like Attack of Clones is actually how, how does it, you know, the Clone Wars affect our characters and actually still, how does Anakin Skywalker start to, you know, carry on that descent that we see, you know, we see him attack uh, the Tuscans and stuff like that. But then after that, you know, it's quite happy at the end. He's, he's getting married and stuff, albeit in secret. But it's a bit like a COVID kind of wedding where there's only a couple of people there. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. That's one way of putting it. Just to say, we're getting loads of nice comments in the sidebar yeah. here. We do see everything. Uh, so thank you. Keep keep talking. It's great. We're loving it. Um, 
Yeah, I think a lot of people have great memories of seeing Empire. I'm noticing there's a lot of people who are sort of similar age, certainly to me, maybe not you so much. But uh, but uh, it, what do you think then, given that you saw Empire, you saw it on video uh, as a kid, and then you saw it at the cinema for the first time at the special edition era, Yeah, and seeing, seeing Empire on the big screen is just like, whoa, because it's so visual, it's so beautiful a film. Was that experience very different for you from from watching it at home video when you can pause it, go out, make a cup of tea, come back sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, there is that. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I can remember I I was really sick. I I had really bad tonsillitis. Oh, mate, you still are. Yeah. You still are. Thanks. Yeah. No, I was, I had really bad tonsillitis. Um, and I can remember I, it was for one occasion that I'd taken a day off school and my my mum had actually been let me out afterwards because she'd always said, if you're off sick, then you don't go out and you don't play. But I was just like, yeah. but it's Star Wars. And she's like, you know, if you think you can sit there and survive the three hours with the trailers and stuff, then fine, we'll take you. But otherwise, yeah, you just kind of sit it out. So I just peeled, peeled myself out, ibuprofen, neurofen, paracetamol, and just kind of in, had a big tub of ice cream and drinks and just kind of like, just kind of had to, yeah, grin and bear it. But I think any time you get the opportunity to see a Star Wars film on the big screen, it's a treat. I mean, we've just recently had the 40th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back. It's back in the cinemas, in the UK at least. Um, and I saw it yeah. in uh, uh, the other day. Well, back in June, actually, was the first weekend that the cinemas were open. And it was great. I mean, because it is, you know, these these films and, and cinema in general deserves to be seen on a big screen, not on a four by three pan and scan or a widescreen 169 version on a CRT. So, so how was your, I mean, how did you see it? Well, I mean, I, I know you saw it at the cinema, but how was your kind of like experience having seen it in the original format and then seeing the special edition? How was that? It's a weird one because I think we knew in two, well, sorry, 97, we knew the special, well, we knew the prequel trilogy was coming put your teeth in yeah. uh so so there was all that expectation and there was all the talk of the pepsi deal you know and the money that was going to fund it and all the you know it was lots of stuff sort of milling around fandom as it was there was an internet but there was no social media thank goodness there was no social media um so it was a different experience you know and and i think having it come back was so exciting because we'd seen it back in 1980 and then it got the double bill release before jedi then we got the triple bill after jedi yeah you know, which I know a lot of folks saw it in, the, in London when it was on this, uh, you know, down at the Dominion and yeah. places like that. But then it did sort of circuit around the country. And you'd get occasional, it would occasionally crop up, but by then, sort of by, I think, 84, I think it was on television. And then Empire was sort of, you'd see it every two or three years on television. Yeah. So, that, you know, it's kind of when they did the promotional stuff for the special edition, obviously, primarily it was Star Wars, but it worked so well, they thought, let's just do the three. Mm. Um, part of the marketing was, you know, you, you know, for generations you've seen it on television. Maybe not generations, but you know, the marketing push was for generations yeah. you've seen Star Wars only on the television. Now seen on the big screen, yeah. and I think Empire. I mean, Jedi was just insanely beautiful with so much going on. But I think Empire, from a visual point of view, and you mentioned Last Jedi, and, the, and one thing that's always said about Last Jedi is what a gorgeous film it is to look oh, it's at beautiful. visually. Yeah, but... It needs to be on the big screen, yeah. uh, and I think Empire is the same. Mm. So, so to see it up there again with that music, which we've become so familiar with, and we'll start talking about some other bits in a moment because that all kind of bleeds out from from that experience, initial experience, uh, and, and to see it again, and and like, obviously the special edition stuff. There's podcasts, millions of podcasts, been done about how should they have done the special edition. But more to the point, I think now, does it hold up? Mm. Could you could you justify our ALM and Disney going back in and redoing? the visual effects to make them, to bring them up to the level of, of you know yeah. what I mean? There's, there's questions. You can ask it, it, questions about that because that was really early CGI. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think Empire was one of the, well, out of the three was one of the least touched, wasn't it? I mean, there, there was additions and they cleaned, I mean, luckily they cleaned up the mat lines and stuff and uh, the back of half and that, but you know, obviously the main part was, the, the kind of a, the change and the, the the edit to the Wampa Cave and then obviously the kind of a set extensions that um, he did in, in Cloud City. And actually, you know, the aesthetic of Cloud City and the set extensions, I think it's okay. You can kind of see that like when we're running around the corner, the, the comping's a little bit ropey con considering today's yeah. standards. But I think, again, this is the thing. It's like, you know, we're talking about a 40-year-old film 
and at the end of the day the, the optics you know the, the the cameras they used the glass they used on the on the lenses and stuff were of that era and the processing up to that point it's only going to give you a film that's going to be able to be improved so much. I mean, we, we see on the Disney yeah. Plus, um, the HDR version, and that's been cleaned up for 4K. And that's as good as you can get because you can only scan a 35mm print up up to 4K. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he the, the good thing is that all the, the clever thing that um, Lucas did was he, he made a decision back on Star Wars to shoot all your uh, special uh, effects using the VistaVision camera, which is uh, an 8 perf. Yeah. 65 mil kind of like um film so that means that by the time you've done all your optical effects and your layering it the generations uh makes it now yeah. kind of like the same kind of like quality so it kind of matches and that's the only way you could get away with kind of being able to do those effects so um i mean it's it's like anything you know you, you know yourself from the original generation probably wishes they would release an untouched and un, you know unspoiled version I kind of grew up with that kind of version, but I went, you know, I've got the THX remastered versions on VHS and obviously yeah, the, got yeah, the yeah. gold and the silver special editions and stuff like that. Um, you know, and and even, even you know, depending on where you saw A New Hope in the cinema, you know, like, if, did you see it with 35? Did you see it on 70 mil? Did you see it with mono sound? Did you see it with stereo sound? So it's kind of like, for somebody to say, actually, I want to see my version of like, original trilogy is actually there's far more actual different kind of like iterations for you to go through so i mean just you know i mean disney will do what disney does and i guess that's just just how it is really for for yeah. for, for, for time being i see so that's a great point you make though almost incidentally so, uh that if you'd no 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 if you'd seen if you'd seen empire on a plane i mean they did different versions for yeah. different venues yes, almost, didn't they? you know so if you saw empire really early you didn't see the the fleet at the end if you saw it on a plane you saw a 35 mil different sound mix or whatever yeah, you know yeah, what i mean there's yeah. like different versions yeah exactly and i mean there's you know there's there's websites and stuff like that that kind of track all those changes and stuff like that um yeah. you know i think i think the version that we've now got is probably the version we're gonna we're gonna live with i think you know, forward. so I think whatever, so whatever kind of tweaks and changes they made for the last time, it was uh, with digital copies when Lucas last did it. Um, you know, with McClunky and all that kind of stuff. That's probably I knew you were going to say yeah. McClunky. Yeah. Well, how <laughs> how can you not? Um, that's probably that could probably be it, unless of course they, you know, somebody actually has the guts to go right here. You go, this is the the original version. If it properly exists for all three films in in a format, True. in a condition that they can just put out. Um, without having to spend a huge amount of money on it. But, I mean, I think it would sell. So, you know. But, hey. We will see. Well, wouldn't it be great? As a historical piece, oh, yeah. it would be fantastic to see. But one thing about Empire that's weird now, like any, like Star Wars or any first two episodes, and certainly any third episode, you can only take a Star Wars film as its one entire thing from the moment you first saw it back in 77 or whenever you first saw Star Wars, because after that, you've always seen something else. So you can't think of a film in its, in its uniqueness in that sense. And Empire's, just like any other Star Wars project, you can't just think of Empire because you think of mm. other stuff. But back in the day when Empire came out, in terms of ancillary material, there wasn't a lot of stuff. I mean, there was the comics, yeah. which we'll get to in a moment. You know, there was your read along adventures, there was the soundtrack, there was the novel, there was the toys, yeah. and there's other panels going to be talking about the toys uh, over the weekend. But, you know, it's difficult to consider Empire just as its own thing. But before we knew all the reveals from Jedi, before we knew, spoiler alert, that Luke was Vader's son and that Han and Leia were going to get together, mm. and, you know, and all the other reveals that came out, and obviously, you know, the resolution was what it was at the time of Jedi, and it's now again looked through a different lens now after Rise of Skywalker, and just things yeah. change. Empire left us with so many questions. There's, I've seen it in the in the chat on the side of the screen. You know, there was that three year gap between Star Wars and Empire, which was which was tough, but we didn't know what we were going to get with Empire. But once we'd got Empire, mm. and we resolved and tightened up all those relationships and built out the story even more. I can't honestly think of a film that was probably more more desired and more longed after mm. than Jedi. So that Empire to Jedi stretch was incredible because we didn't have any of the answers and we didn't have, like I just said, we didn't have the internet. 
We didn't have social media. We couldn't dig on people for having different opinions on what might happen or might not. It was a free for all in the playground, and it was it was a brilliant mm. time to be a Star Wars fan. So we, you and yeah. me, have been looking at some of the comics from back yes, in the we day. Have. <laughs> I thought this would be fun because you and me had a chat, and I didn't realise that you'd never read them. And then I thought, well, why would you? Because you know you're a bit younger than me, and and you you were more Dark Horse here in the Marvel original Marvel yep. era. But for me. Back in the day, every month this thing, or weekly initially, but monthly eventually, and then back to weekly when Jedi came out, this was my soap opera. So as a kid, this was this was it. This was everything for those 30 days between the issues coming out. There was nothing else. So I thought it'd be fun for us to have a look at a certain chunk of that run of the UK Marvel Star Wars titles, starting with issue 159, which very nicely tallies up with the American issue 59. Thank you, Marvel, for doing that complete fluke yeah. i think um so you've recently read these i mean like very recently yes. read these what did you think bear in mind you've seen all the stuff that's come out you're bang up to date with the audio books you you know we've seen all the films and watched the tv the mandalorian is very much of this yeah. era um what did you think when you first started reading bear in mind you started about issue 140 so I, you've read yeah. a chunk before yeah. so i about. i mean basically i started with the adaptation of the Empire Strikes Back, um, and that um, the first the first thing, um, yeah, well, basically that the first thing that the American um, that I noticed was that they they basically split it over over twelve issues, and so actually it took about like seven or eight issues just to get off Hoff. So it was actually, <laughs> I mean, it was actually really kind of um, they went into quite a lot of detail. They kind of covered all the scenes. And um, and there was there's portions where the dialogue was kind of the same, and then there's portions where the dialogue was kind of like totally different. But what was really interesting was two things. One, um, I was surprised that it was black and white, and two, yeah. that there's a lot of narration throughout. Everything's driven by narration, whereas like modern comics, at least modern Star Wars comics, tends to be, you know, it's inner thoughts and kind of like you know um re reactions and kind of conversations that push things along whereas a lot of that kind of stuff doesn't so it did take a little while because i was reading these digitally as well so um they were kind of a little bit harder i'm not a huge fan of reading comics digitally i mean i don't know what other people think but um it doesn't be a nice piece of paper in your hand um but yeah so um and then after the Empire Strikes Back novelization, we kind of get into some of like some quite bizarre-ish kind of stories. I say bizarre-ish. I mean they're they're not too dissimilar from some of the stuff we've seen in like Dark Horse and in like later Marvel stuff. And they're not you know not some of it's not completely out there, but it was just the stuff like for instance there was one story arc where um, Princess Leia is on a planet. And Darth Vader turns up with kind of like three henchmen. One of them basically looks like Dracula and the other guy looks like a creature from the Black Lagoon and stuff like that. It's all a little bit kind of yeah. like, uh, yeah, some some of that stuff wasn't quite as well kind of developed. But the original Empire yeah. Strikes Back um, novelization, well, not novelization, the adaptation, one thing that I felt was really, really good was the... the, 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 the drawings from the starships. Like some of those um, drawings were amazing. Like I, I thought they were like quite technical and it, almost like they'd been kind of done by a more like a technical kind of um, draftsman yeah. rather than actually like a, a comic book artist. So that was quite yeah. cool. Uh, yeah. See, like it, it, yeah, so Lucas, Lucas was a big Flash Gordon yeah. fan, as everybody knows, and and that's what he wanted Star Wars to be before he couldn't get the the rights to do it. And from what I understand, I think Al Williamson that drew Empire was requested by George because he'd drawn the King features comic strip or, or newspaper strip version of flash gordon so george wanted his artwork in there and so you know and like you say yeah it looks it looks incredible yeah. and it's from an earlier version of the script as well which is why somebody she you know i've, the, I've got the uk and you're down here somewhere which i think you've got as well mm -hmm. um depends on which version you've got but earlier ones have the purple the purple yoda with the white hair and later ones at williamson drew a Yoda that we would recognise, and they sort of cut, literally, literally cut and paste yeah. it over, you know, to, to put it, it in. Uh, be quite interesting to see what version you've got. Whilst you're finding that page, just to show people who don't know, this is from an earlier, earlier issue, and there's uh, the UK sort of format, so it's much more magazine, black and white, 
And also, they would have to sometimes, because it is a magazine format, and this is something 2000 AD found when they took their issues to the American market, they would have to re-move the, the boxes around to make them fit fit the different formats. So it's kind of cool to see it in black and white. This was this was the very first issue of Empire Monthly yeah. I got when I sort of uh, had a little break from reading the comics and then uh, started picking, picked this one up and very quickly started reading it again after about a year and then managed to pick all the ones I was missing up off a right. friend of mine. Let me, uh, I'm just going to open that up there first. Let me see if I can. So there you go. Uh, center panel. Can you see him? Hey, Purple go. Yoda smoking a pipe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of, I mean, I'm guessing this must have been written. And and this was my feeling was like, um, bearing in mind that in some of the, like in Hoff, they're, they're kind of the, the whole like, subplot of um, like the Wampa, K, the Wampa being in the base and stuff like that is still in the comics. So they must have been basing this off like concept yeah. art and uh, like an earlier earlier draft. Earlier drafts, yeah. 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 And it's funny because it was of that time, We, I mean, people had video and piracy was really sort of kicking off then, which is terrible. We shouldn't do it, but we did. Uh, pirate videos. So, so many yeah. movies that you would see. I think the first time I saw E.T. was on a pirate video on holiday. You know, it was just what was done. A friend of mine, and his dad worked on the yeah. oil rigs and he came back with, uh, I think Jedi came out here a few weeks after it did in the States. I know I certainly saw Jedi on video before I saw it on the television, on the, the cinema because the pirate videos. But thing being is that those comics mm -hmm. then was all we really had. We had the soundtrack with the, you know, the 12 tracks or whatever. It wasn't a single disc, but then, you know, you would go and see, um, you'd read the empire comic and then that would become your, that was what you knew. And Marvel did a lot of adaptations back in the day. You'd get your novelizations was a big thing, you know, so you'd read, you know, the novelization of Ghostbusters yeah. in the morning. And that's how you knew the film really well, because it wasn't on video for a couple of years. It's just the way it was. So those those books and comics were, you know, incredibly important. Cool. All right. So I was going to show people, I was going to just load up um, some screenshots of some of the comics and stuff. Um, but I don't know if I can do it. I think you need to unlock something. Actually, no, I need to unlock something. Here we go. Right. So let me see if I can do this for people who want to see. So then this is wow, this awesome. might be awesome. Tech master. <laughs> here we go. Right, here we go. So you should be able to see that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, here you go. So this is the first, this is just the first um, episode. And they were quite short, really. And you can see it's literally like about eight pages. And then it goes into like a different story altogether, um, which kind of really a massive thing about the Star Wars comics again. That's a really good point you make. Was the backup strips being a UK comic? I did. A, I used to do a series on Star Wars dot com called um, Star Wars in the UK. So it was looking back at Star Wars Weekly, Star Wars Monthly, some of the stuff we're going to talk about in a minute. But one thing that made the UK comics unique to the American ones was the American one was purely Star Wars. There was nothing else generally in it, but other than yeah. Star Wars and some adverts. In the UK, you'd have Guardians of the Galaxy, you'd have Tales of the Watcher, you'd have. Rom was a regular backup strip. Years later, you get Power Pack, and you get you used to get some like really, really random European ones. I can't even remember yeah. what they were called now. And also, we probably won't touch on it today, but there were some UK only stories as well, like Death Mask and Tilotli Throws a Shape, and all you know, little weird Alan Moore written random mm. one off, almost gothic horror type stories, Flight of the Falcon. So there was some interesting stuff in the UK comics that didn't come out in the States. And I think Dark Horse collected them. I think it was a Devil Worlds collection, put the UK yeah. ones together. So they, they are out there. I mean, he, so this is a great example of the fact that this was uh, definitely, um, you know, in, you know, being written and drawn during the production because you've got this, um, just this text. Yeah. Leah, I don't really know yeah. how to say this, but you must know that you, well, you're the, the only one I... I and then, you know yeah. there's there's still quite a lot of heavy overtures of the kind of like um even after Empire like even after this you know the not uh the actual kind of like the film and that there's 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 still moments in in some of the stories we're going to talk about that is we'll be back in five seconds yeah what Mark was saying was yeah obviously as you move on into the comics when we did a show recently, we were part of a show called Empire 40. So on Empire 40, 
I had the chance to talk to Walt Simonson. You're back. Um, and, uh, and you know, obviously Simonson was saying that he only had access to certain storylines. He couldn't do the story of a Death Star. Or he couldn't. There's things he was told he had to steer clear of. He couldn't have Luke and Leia together. He mm. was never told why. They're writers. They figured it out. But you know what I mean? There was There was lots of ground things that they were told they had to steer clear of. Uh, I think he said they pitched an idea for some sort of creatures that were a little bit like Ewoks, and they were told to steer clear of that. So, you know, there was lots of provisional stuff put down. Just, just I've got to answer Chris Alexander. No, they weren't colouring books, but they did get <laughs> coloured in, just so you know. Um, but, yeah, so so there was it was a unique time because – and we'll get into it. We've, we've made a few notes because it's a long time since I've read these, and I had a nice little refresh yeah. over the last week or so to, to go back into it. But we thought we'd pick up with, uh, with the – issues from when the magazine the monthly magazine changed from empire monthly to star wars monthly so that was with issue 159 which american readers will know was was the issue bizarre when uh luke and the team went to uh met up with orion ferret it's got to call orion ferret on a like a casino planet called bizarre and they're trying to basically get four tie fighters they need four tie fighters to do this special mission the great thing about the comic was it felt like that's the one. It felt like a a soap opera. It had that sequential, ongoing sort of backup character feel about it, but it still very much felt like Star Wars, working within within the constraints of what they were told they couldn't couldn't touch on by Lucasfilm. And it's a bit like when Brian Daly mm. wrote the Han Solo novels, and Lucasfilm said, or probably, you know, probably came from George to be fair, but Lucasfilm said, you can't use Vader. You can't use this. You can't use that. You know, you can have the Falcon Chewie in hand, and that's pretty much it. You can't really refer to anything else. So they set it in the corporate sector, and it's a completely separate thing. There you go. That's the one. The greatest space fantasy of all. No kidding. Um, what did you think of this? Reading these for the first time, what was your thoughts when you start piling into um, these issues? But I was actually pleasantly surprised. And I think what I tried to do was I tried to actually put them into – into context you know how you said earlier on about at the time there was nothing there wasn't really any any ancillary um uh kind of like products really other beyond soundtracks and stuff yeah. and so the comics is is the only real source for kind of like new um storytelling really um and so some of it's a little there's a little there's kind of like a sense of humor which is kind of like slightly off kilter from what we've I, I've seen it in Star Wars, really. Like, there's, um, I can't remember which issue it is, but there's an issue where there's, um, like, an Imperial uh, officer who's just wearing, like, a crazy funny cap. I mean, he gets kind of, like, um, he gets told off for it. But it's just, like, I just don't ever think that in, in modern-day Star Wars, and say modern-day, even going back to Dark Horse, that they would have, um, they probably would have done something like that, unless it was completely, like, irreverent, like, um, Tag and Bink. If it was, like, a completely kind of, um different kind of uh kind of story kind of like feel but this has kind of got humor throughout i mean yeah some of the banter is pretty good in this um and 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 i was quite surprised actually how this story develops and actually the cat you know the characters in this that we kind of especially start to see in 160 um is, is really interesting because like it's it's Shearer's story which um is a fascinating yeah. character and um some people i mean I was really surprised and it wasn't until I started reading this and then read some of the other stuff and then joined the dots up and with the help of Wikipedia realized that she was also then basically as an alter ego in the legacy of the force books as well. Um, yeah. 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 So it, it was just yeah, crazy. Yeah. I mean, but like, I mean, this kind of storyline of, um, you know, going to steal four TIE fighters so you can basically infiltrate uh, an Amada map is it's it's kind of classic Star Wars, really. It's it's perfect for what we kind of want, um, and it's beautifully drawn as well. Walt Simonson was was drawing, and I think uh, yeah. Tom Palmer was inking. Good old Tom Palmer that makes everybody look like Tom Palmer. <laughs> it, was, it was just beautiful. But um, the the issues look great. There's a dynamic move and feel to these comics. They feel very kinetic in a way that, weirdly, I think sometimes the modern comics when they're beautifully, I'm not criticizing, but they're beautifully mm. colored and they look fantastic. To me, this black line pen and ink is way more dynamic mm. in, in, in its own way. It's, it's got a movement that yeah. these current ones don't really have. And I'm sorry, Martin Keeler, you will never know the fruit gum secret. I'm <laughs> okay. sorry. Carry See, on. now, but what I was going to say was, 
one thing that I found, and actually in a couple of these earlier uh, uh, issues, I did struggle um, without the color because actually it's it's all black and white, and it's you know so it's it's high contrast, especially when you're looking on a screen. But um, so there's yeah. points where I'm just like I'm, I'm finding it hard to figure out where they are because there's, it's just like you know sometimes patches yeah. of white and then just patches of gray and black and stuff. It can, it's you know it's just kind of like I suppose in my mind being so used to um, comics and stuff with with color, full color comics. It, it's a bit of a step back but yeah. one thing i have liked yeah. and i've just parked on it is just where it's just like they have these nice asterisks where they kind of when they reference a previous comic they just say last issue one. that's yeah. an old marvel trick that is an old school marvel trick i think they probably still do it but they always did they the the assistant editor or the editor would just come up and I'll refer yeah. back to issue I mean, 152 I think, I or whatever they do do it's, that it's, with the modern star wars comics i could be wrong but um it's just because like um you know, especially when you get stuff like, you know, Dr. Afro, who's kind of in the Darth Vader novels, and then she crosses over to Star Wars, like, you know, for, you know, Vader down and stuff yeah. like that. Um, uh, thanks, Alexander. Um, appreciate the tip. Um, yeah, it's just like, um, yeah, it just, I think some of that kind of stuff would really help, uh, really. I mean, you know, so anyway, I digress. But this, I mean, this storyline is pretty cool. Just, just check out what's what's your scroll in there, Mark. Just to say, some of these covers yeah. are absolutely beautiful. John Higgins, who was an old school Marvel guy, UK Marvel guy, just did some beautiful artwork. Um, um, and again, I, I did a series on uh, StarWars.com about these issues, just so you can have a little peek inside about what they're all about. There's a bit more detail. Pariah, yeah. I mean, that's the one. That's you mentioned Shira as a character, and I don't know if anybody in the in the comments remembers. Um, ah, there you go. Yeah. I remember yeah. thinking Luke was being unfaithful to Leia by flirting with Brie. Exactly, yeah. It was very much that kind of vibe. She was almost tempting him away. And you were just on issue 162, I think, where yeah. she gets the medal from Leia on Arbor um, before the mission. That that was as dramatic. Certainly as a kid, yeah. that whole storyline was just tremendously dramatic. Yeah, it must be. Because... You know, we, we didn't know what was going to happen in Jedi. We didn't know where these characters were going to go. And also, you've got to remember, there's no Han Solo. He was yeah. the swashbuckling character. He was the he was the action driver for many of those early issues of Star Wars we Weekly, as we knew it, um, and Empire Weekly. But it was just so mm. unique at the time. What did you think about it then? Getting into the mission, we're looking at the page where Shira has now been shot. So... Uh, just to explain to people that, that never saw or read it, and you should, I highly recommend going back and reading these. And there's various versions out there from Marvel and from Dark Horse that you can still get. But um, they go on the mission. They infiltrate the Armada. Um, they manage to get so far and take down this uh, a unique yep. creature. I think it was called the Teasel that was a basically a, a living communications relay that could send messages in real time all around the galaxy. It would have given the Empire the advantage in the war beyond doubt. And they have to take it out, and they do. But Luke gets beyond all the Tie Fighters and has one in his in his way. Uses the Force, shoots it down, and gets out of there. But um, he doesn't know. But he's actually killed Shira, Shira, who's like who's become almost on a par with Luke in the affections of the Alliance. So he is literally the prior of the storyline. What did you think of that when you read it for the first time? I can't believe I'm saying this um, for the first time just I a was, few days ago. Yeah, I, to, to be honest. Up until this storyline, from what I'd read, obviously I'd read the, the, the adaption, so it's just basing everything off of the film. But some of the other stories that I'd read were kind of really frivolous and a bit kind of throwaway. But this was the first kind of like arc that I read where I was like, this is kind of pretty serious stuff because actually, and, and clever as well. It's yeah. clever in the fact that basically what ends up happening is that um, we, uh, we, it's it's all a plan basically to, dis, to, to get the Rebel Alliance to turn on on Luke. So it's a plan by, by Vader basically to kind of get yeah. the rubber lines to kind of like, you know, almost disown him and kick him out and that for, for this. So it's quite interesting because like, you know, you'll see um, in a couple of panels time, you know, here you go. So he's in the, um, like the, the rebel can uh, mess hall. Yeah. Uh, the mess, and, he, yeah. you know, some of the guys just kind of like kick off on him. Um, so let's go. So you go. That's quite a good good panel there. You know, I haven't heard so much quiet since my last solo uh, flight in deep space. Um, and then you've got the classic, you know, sorry, there's no food. You you know, maybe it's time to go and eat you know, back there. So, um, yeah. 
it, you know, and it was quite interesting. I mean, it, it was quite in. Uh, I enjoyed how quickly they turned as well, because like I'm, you know, at this point, I, yes, Luke is still, you know, the hero of the rebellion, and he destroyed the Death Star. Star. But you know these Rebel Alliance characters are just yeah. kind of looking out for themselves, you know, for for each other, and to have somebody like Luke, who's potentially, you know, taken one down, you know, even accidentally, it kind of starts to kind of you know show a lot of people's kind of prejudice to like you know force sensitives and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I was, yeah, I was just re- this was a really good uh, a good arc, um, really. So and also. You don't miss Han in this, I don't think. So this story, the way this story is kind of written, no. it's so Luke centric. You just don't miss him. And I also liked that, even in this one, um, kind of going back to what I mean, Chris said about like um, he felt a bit kind of odd or a bit jealous that Luke's kind of like you know hooking up with Bree and not Leia. I mean, there's still that sexual tension between. Yeah. Leia and um, Luke, even though she kind of like there's there's panels where she's kind of talking about how she misses Han, and you know she wishes that and like you know he was around and stuff like that, um, you know. So it, it's it's still kind of like quite interesting. Was like you know with forty years kind of you know perspective to kind of look back and go, you know, they really didn't know where it was going to go in Jedi. So. No, and it, it's cool as well. You make a good point. Is that because they, because the writers didn't know, but they had certain parameters, but not why they didn't know that the brother and sister reveal and Endor was coming up. They didn't know about that. That that they could sort of play it almost as you. We're getting into dodgy territory here. Almost yeah. as you would if you didn't know, you know, without going over a line. <laughs> and we'll say no more than that. But it was nicely played in the comics, especially especially a kids' comic, you know. And and as you say, we've moved on to the mind spider now. So Luke has. Uh, borrowed the Falcon from Lando uh, and travelled back to Shalavain to try and figure out what Shira's history was. Does the um, cuts his palm in a ritual like she had, and it activates the the hologram of Vader, who basically tells the whole story of that she was an Imperial agent. She was planted there to discredit Luke. Again, you know, it's they could have stretched it out longer, but it was a different. Uh, to quote the original novel, a different galaxy, a different time. You know, a month was a longer, longer period of time when you were a kid than it is now. That's for sure. Um, so, you know, they probably did it just about right. By the way, thank you, Alyssa, for the for the tip. Thank you very much. Um, so, what did you think of that as the story progresses? We're moving into Luke now, trying to clear his name. Once he clears his name, we're back into adventures. What did you think of some of those adventures as we moved on? through the Shira story, because the Shira story takes a backseat and comes back in with a yeah, vengeance. Yeah, um, that was the thing. Jedi. They kind of, they resolved it, but they didn't really resolve it. It was kind of, it's it's not fully resolved, and it's, but it's not even really mentioned. I mean, I mean, they, uh, I mean look at that, that's just, uh, I mean, yeah. This is the classic, Sophidian Eyes. Exactly. <laughs> that's I a mean, classic issue. I mean, what we what we do, and 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 this is something that we're now seeing with uh, the current run of Marvel, Marvel uh, Star Wars comics is that they're now, you know, we're now on the hunt for um, for for Han. We're basically trying to track down and look. There's for those who who love them. Yeah. There's a hujib right there. Um, yeah, so can't 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 not. Yes. This is this is why this is anything that's come since. This is before Jedi. Don't forget. This is who jibs were pre pre Jedi, and I know you know who jibs because you yeah, you've, and I you've got the book and the planet the who jibs book. So. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, funny, yes, of course. Well, funny enough, it literally it's literally to hand. That's my that's my copy cool. of Planet of the Who Jibs with the cassette. So they really did. It was one of the first sort of things to spin out from from certainly from the comics hmm. to become something bigger. Pro, you know, Droid World did it as well. Uh, they did the the audio book of Droid World, but it, it's a time when they didn't really expand on things, and the Hujibs hit so well. And Arbra as a rebel base was so. I kind of think of Ajahn Klaus. It it's bit. kind of almost yeah. like, yeah, like, um, like Arbra. It's, you know, it's kind of got, there's, it, a, so. there's a history there that we kind of we kind of learn more about, in, and I think a couple of issues in that. Um, but I mean, what's actually really cool, even back then, is that um, they kind of they, they seem to be addressing the lack of female characters in um, in the Star Wars universe. Because any time a Luke's got a wingman, it just seems that like one of them is a, a wing woman, I suppose you'd say, and is a is an awesome pilot. Um, you know, this one's like Captain Sindra yeah. Tyrell, and that I guess, or something Tyrell. 
Um, and, you know, they're, it's, it's quite nice and refreshing to see that. And we're, we moved on to, yeah, so. But yeah. it, what's it, I mean, what I kind of found quite quite interesting was like this, they kind of, they, this like this one, this storyline in, in particular is, is a little bit odd because it's kind of like um it's all about like medieval jousting really that's kind of it is it's very it's very much yeah medieval you style so in fact issue you can this see one, yeah. see their their the jousting and that and and but and also by the text i mean that is not in star wars font that that meanwhile yep. and and <laughs> no so <laughs> that's i mean that's quite fun i mean but it's it is a that's one of the reasons one where I read and I was like yeah okay I kind of get this is a kind of bit of a, a nothing story but you know as as with everything there's always a little bit to kind of move the overall arc on so go back one page there Mark go back one page just to the previous another one I think if you scroll down yeah. there you go to the right she's wearing Leia's metal bikini I mean that is. That is, there's no doubt oh, she is still oh, yeah, in totally. metal bikini yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, that. It's like they knew. It's like one of the earlier issues. They had a, a, a kids' drawing competition where kids would send in yeah. first, their own versions of spaceships. Somebody was in the know yeah, because I, I swear yeah, one I, of those was an A wing. Yeah, that's totally, was in this. totally yeah, an A wing. It's, I mean, but the thing is, this is the kind of stuff that, like, you know, if if we reviewed this today on um, Cannon Fodder, um, you know, we I think we'd tear this episode, you know, this issue apart because it's, I mean, it's fine, it's nice and throwaway, but it's just like, it, I mean, it's so not Star Wars. It's um, it's unbelievable because it's just there's just totally. so much, like, too, there's too much kind of Earth references and stuff and periodic Earth references, which I think just don't work really. Um, yeah. It's way more like, I hate to say it, I hate to say it, I don't really, but I do. <sighs> it's more like a Star Trek episode. It's more like they've gone to an alternate yeah. reality, you know, an alternate world that's, you know, week. developed and in it's, a different And way. it happens to be like yeah. a medieval thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And actually, this is like, I mean, you don't see this very often, but um, this is one of the rare times that it seems in the comics that we're looking at, you actually get some kind of onomatopoeia, you actually get some kind of these words, you know, describing sound effects, because a lot of times you don't seem to get a huge amount of that. So, you know, it must be something that was kind of just coming in. Um, to Yeah, and they did that really weird sort of balloony sort of lettering. I've been told off for mentioning Star Trek. Sorry, Chris. And Trevor's absolutely right. Early Star yeah. Wars was weird. And I think it, it, was, it was almost beautiful for being weird. <laughs> you know, I think there's a tendency sometimes to try and make everything fit a, a consistent yeah. feel. And if 2020's taught me anything, it's that life don't go the no. way it's going to go. and um, you know, so so to have these quirky, odd little... I mean, that was probably re- drawn as a fill-in story they could drop in exactly. when it was suitable. You know, they could easily lead into that if they were behind schedule or whatever. I interviewed Joe Duffy years ago, and she was an ed- editor a bit later on, but she said, you know, they would have these issues in the draw that they could pull out if they needed it. Um, another John Higgins cover there, beautiful item and 3PO issue. But where are we now? What issue is that? 165, yeah, is that? check you out. Yeah. I can't quite see, yeah. So one sixty five. So Goldrath never forget. So we find out now. Luke's Luke's hope. You know, can, Luke's sorry, hope. Sorry, hope sorry, can we hit. just pause and appreciate the haircuts in this ad? And actually, this is great oh, because this is a Marvel comic, and you've got Superman, uh, Superman. fighting the fight against uh, smoking, which I just love. Um, but anyhow, sorry. Um, yes, exactly. Yes, Nickel T. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's that that takes me back. I remember. I remember that. That advertising thing very well, um, but uh, yeah, they they find out that the walls of of one of the caves on Arbor is kind of holding, or rather, on Golrath, one of the previous planets have been on, yeah. was was those hollow recording stuff that they were talking about. So there was a chance the Empire could get there, get the information, find out where Arbor was, the Rebel base, and chasing down. So we've got to go back and try and you know fix that scenario. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a fascinating it's a fascinating little run of stories. Hmm. Yeah, um, let's. I tell you what, let's quickly jump on to. Uh, so, Water Bandits again is one of those kind of ones which is kind of is actually fairly kind of slightly more uh, has has a more kind of modern feel. Like it's something that actually I could see Marvel doing something like this. You know, in in the current run where you've got Luke kind yeah. of landing on a planet and then kind of helping 
helping them out. It's 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 again. It's it feels more like an Obi Wan story. You know what? No, Obi Wan. That it feels like an Obi Wan story to me yeah. in a weird way. You know, the, the the man alone in the desert sort of story. Yeah, but it was. Um, Look at that cover. So it's a so it's the it's a Mandalore one. Which one's that? Uh, it's oh, I think you're a little bit after that one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so, uh, so eight. Yeah. Yeah. So right. So we go to this one. So here we go. I mean that's. That, that looks like a, I, I mean, I love this piece of artwork just because it's like, it's Chewbacca and there's an Indiana Jones whip. And it, I mean, nothing screams kind of like early 80s more than that, I think. That's just amazing. <laughs> it just, it's, there's something about the way the, the kind of, it's like a soft kind of diffuseness with with the art on, on these. Yeah. But I just think it's awesome. Anyhow, I digress. It's beautiful pieces of um, art, really. Yeah, I mean... So yeah, so basically this is this is where the search begins for, for Han. And actually what they do, some really nice kind of um panels here you go, where it kind of uh, this is a, a lovely panel where you can basically see like Han and Leia when we first meet and the um with Death Star and then the kiss, and then obviously, you know, this is you know Leia trying to rescue uh, Han for, from Boba Fett, and obviously we can see her in a flight suit. And it's great because I can remember when in the Star Wars run back in like 20, I don't know, would have been just before um, Disney Dark bought it. Run. Yeah, and she's in the black flight suit and stuff like that. Yeah. I yeah. I was just like, wow, it's so cool seeing, you know, uh, Leia in an X-Wing costume and here she is in a in another one. That's another so, point. Just quick, quick side, when people think about Leia now, some, some some criticism has been put out that, you know, Leia is now a bit like, more, she's more like Xena than, than Leia. You know, she's punching people and doing this and doing that. You go, to splinter of the mind's eye and she's flying the y-wing she was yeah. picking up guns in star wars she's always done that you know so and, and really shows up in the marvel comics as well how versatile just as versatile as anybody else she was she was right there on the front line yeah exactly she's um I bet there's quite a few episodes uh issues where she is kind of like she is front and center and she's you yeah. know uh she's kind of like taken on vader like i said like there's an issue um just after the empire strikes back um, adaption finishes where um you know she's toe to toe with vader you know yeah. so here we go yeah. so this is interesting because um they land on mandalore yes and uh and so this is you know this this was the first i think the first glimpse that we really see into one iteration of mandalorian culture um and it just so happens that the planet has basically been taken over by slavers and protected by imperials but yet um, there is a few Mandalorian protectors still around. And one of them, here he goes, there's a nice silhouette, is this chap here. No, it's not Boba Fett. Uh, it's, what's his name, Mark? Because I'm... Fen 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 Shisa. There you go. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so it's it's quite, it's quite interesting because it's like... Uh, um, You've, you've got this you've got this guy you think he's probably going to be like boba fett and stuff and it turns out actually he's he's all right he's a bit cocky he does try yeah. to you know hit on layer quite a bit but um <laughs> but it's, it's funny when you look back you look back to the mando yeah. history especially if you think about it in those terms for years and years and before attack of the clones really when they sort of started to change the history of boba fett You'd got all and Dark Horse had already already gone there with with their comics and titles in the nineties. I think there's a panel today or tomorrow on Force Vesta called Bounty on Barcuda. I think, um, you know, so there's different, you know, there's different opportunities or, or different timelines rather, or different threads or different histories of of the Mandalorian culture, the Boba Fett history, Concord Dawn, all that sort of stuff. Mm. There's lots of things, and this very much plays into that. It's really interesting to look back at now. Yeah, yeah, it is very much. It's. Uh... Um, and, and this is, I mean, it's great because again, it's like, you know, I mean, how much, how much did they have to go on, you know, to, to build up a backstory? And it's just, Nothing. I think, Bare well, bone. exactly. And I, I mean, probably like a top trading card. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but also, I just think it's like, it's that whole thing of like, you know, how many different iterations since the Empire Strikes Back have we had of Mandalorian culture or Mandalorian history? You yeah. know, but All it's so it, Travis stuff and yeah. Exactly, you know, Clone Wars, and then you know, and and even now with Mandalorian, it's going to be a slightly yeah. different iteration of what the history is. I think so. It's it's fascinating. So, 
Yeah, I've really so this, enjoyed it. Actually, watching me. Sorry. Yep. I was, no, I was going to say, I mean, I think we've only got five minutes left. Uh, just to say, Chris, absolutely. Plug away. More than welcome to plug away. Um, I think, w- yeah, what was your what would your takeaway be from reading these issues? Now you've not read them for all these years, and, and I've given you this this uh, task yeah. of, of having a look at issues. Uh, bearing in mind, reading the current stuff, we talk about it every month yeah. on Cannon Fodder. So, you know, what do you what do you think of these? Are they worthwhile? Because they they really took a battering from fans in the in the sort of the nineties, especially. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of love for them now. It's coming round again. I think I think it's a nostalgia factor for one. I think also it is that you know you, you take it with a like a pinch of salt and all that. And I think you, you have to approach it a either as a product of its time or just some kind of like frivolous kind of thing fair you know if you if you want your serious star wars then you don't really want to read the original kind of marbles run but i think there's so many bits and pieces and be it like a name or some kind of like um, piece of technology that gets used in the expanded universe and some of it makes its way into like you know modern canon it's so worth just kind of like you know reading all this stuff just so you kind of have it an even bigger kind of broader understanding of Star Wars history, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So do you wish that, do you like the current feel of the comics? Do you kind of wish it had this vibe about it? I mean, obviously it, life has moved on and the Star Wars yeah. galaxy has moved on. It's probably not achievable, but do you kind of wish it had this whimsy. I think maybe the IDW comics are more in this vein nowadays, aren't they? Yeah. The yeah I think, I think you just about to say it, whimsical is a, is definitely a good term to use. I think, I mean, you know, we have, we haven't really mentioned like Jackson and people like that, but then, you know, look at um, the, the current run of bounty hunters and stuff like that, you know, so you've got balance in there. So there's, there's stuff. And I mean, I think, you know, there should be points when when this should be kind of like used as a resource. Yeah. And you then, you know, you don't just kind of like lift it and put it straight in. It's like with Thrawn. You don't just kind of lift Thrawn from Air to the Empire and put him into no. Golden Cannon. You have to port him and you have to kind of uh, refresh him and stuff. And, but I think there's some really strong ideas and some good um, character kind of art models here that you could actually use, which totally. would be kind of like quite fun, you know. So, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe we'll pick this up and talk about it either on Making Tracks or on Cannon Fodder. But, yeah. but you know, I think I think Shira Bree is a character. You could look at Shira and go, well, there's definitely elements of Mara Jade in there. There's definitely elements of of, of, of later characters. You know, she was such yeah. a rounded, well-rounded, complete character. She came in from pretty much nowhere and then became such a central character to this this little run that we've just talked about. You know, and, and again, it's all leading up to Jedi. It's that big run up to Jedi. You know, um, it, for me as a fan, sort of all these years later, I still think so fondly of this era. You know, this was when I really, I start, I wrote a lot of fan fiction, did a lot of fan audio when I was a kid. It was all off the back of this run of comics. It's when I joined um, Bantha Tracks, you know, the official fan club was sort of 82 this time, you know, the Empire fan kit. It, it, a lot of stuff sort of happened at this period. And when mm. it did this was the comic I was reading. This was what I was getting into. So I'm really glad we've had the chance on Force Fest to, to go through these together. I think it's been, yeah. been really it's fun. It's been fun. So, yeah, awesome. And look at that. We've still got a good two minutes left to, to, to fill. So, oh, is this where we vamp? Is this what we were talking about earlier? Yeah, where's you our said man vape. I'm not vaping. Yeah. No, I didn't say vaping. <laughs> I said vamping. No, I think, I mean, it's, I think it's fun. I mean, but then it's like... I was rearranging my comics the other day and I was flicking through some of the Dark Horse stuff and you just kind of go, some of there's just some great kind of like uh, storylines there. And then there's other points where you just kind of go, yeah, that's probably best left in, you know, in a draw, dark yeah. way. So, you know. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the fun thing about Star Wars is that you can explore it as much as you want and there's books that will go in depth. They've they're just announced they're redoing the complete vehicles cross sections, the credit cross sections book. If you want to go into that kind of depth and detail, it's there if you want it. But if you want to listen to an audio book about furry little rabbits with antennas, it's there as well. So that's the beauty of Star Wars. It's uh, it's great. We've got one minute left. Yeah. Anything you want to say, Mark? Do you want to point people towards the website? Uh, so, well, go to fanfortracks.com if you want the news. Uh, make sure you can uh, like listen to and subscribe to Making Tracks, uh, Cannon Fodder, Desert planet discs for all the fan for tracks kind of podcasts uh donate to make a wish and the link is in the chat 
and everybody just have a great force fest i think just Absolutely. enjoy yourself enjoy and yourself in the panels yeah. yes yes Fantasy tracks radio making tracks kind of fodder Panther Down Under. There's a new show coming called Start Your Engines very soon as well. So we're looking forward to doing cool. that. And uh, yes, thank you so much for being a part of this. Enjoy the rest of Force Fest. And uh, we'll see you all in the chat. Nano, nano. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's probably, you know, it's probably still carrying on. There's probably people still watching. Yeah. yeah. Just-